Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Chairman and CEO of OMG, Dr. Richard Sowerly. Uh, you know, come on, Richard. <laughs> That's how it does usually. <laughs> I thought you were going to introduce me. Yeah, I'm introducing you. It's, okay. it's not such funny, but you okay. do better than me. So okay, that, that was a great introduction. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was so gracious. I loved it. Best of me. Yeah. <laughs> he told me before I'm supposed to do my presentation in Bulgarian, so I'm now going to use all of my Bulgarian words. Are you ready? Yeah, Shopska Salata. Blagodaria. So you have a choice today English or Spanish? How many Spanish? Muy bien. Los dos? No, okay. No, I'll do it in English. It's okay. Pero pronto en español. So uh, I, I need to know a little bit more about you. How many of you are engineers? Yeah, that's what I thought. A room full of geeks. Wonderful. Do you, do you, do you, know, what a, you know what an engineer is, by the way? You need to be able to explain what an engineer is in case anyone ever asks you. I'm going to give you the best definition of an engineer. Are you ready? So during the French terror, about 1800 or so, a, a, um, uh, a, a, a priest and a lawyer and an engineer are condemned to die. And first the priest goes up the steps, he puts his head in the guillotine, they read the condemnation, what he's done, the terrible thing he's done and why he must die. I don't know, because he had hair or something. It, it was a bad time. And they pull the rope and the knife comes falling down incredibly fast and stops one centimeter above his neck. The priest jumps out. <coughs> he jumps out and he says, if God, if God has let me go, you must let me go. And they said, yeah, okay, that sounds good. They send him home. The lawyer walks up the steps and they didn't need to explain why he was condemned. <laughs> uh, thank you, yeah. Any lawyers in the room? No, that was close. Okay, um, and um, and the lawyer and, and he puts his he puts his head in the in the guillotine and they yank on the rope and the the blade comes falling at an incredible pace and stops one centimeter above his neck, and the lawyer jumps up and he said, "Citoyen Robespierre himself has said you have only one opportunity to put me to death and you have to let me go." Uh, that's what it says. So send him home. The engineer, the engineer climbs up the steps and he puts his head in the guillotine and he says, wait, I think I see the problem. <laughs> That's the definition of an engineer. I told that joke, by the way, at the beginning of an event in Cork last week and the Irishman told me, you know, you don't know the right one. It's a, it's a Scot and an Englishman and an Irishman. And the Scot and the Englishman are saved from, they, they get a choice of guillotine or hanging. And uh, they both decide on the guillotine and it fails. And the Irishman, they ask him what he wants. He says, I want hanging. That damn guillotine don't work. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about engineers so much, but I'm going to talk about a guy who used to be an engineer. Anybody ever heard of Bill Gates? Yeah, OK. He's a really nice guy. That wasn't true. Um, in 1995, in 1995, not what this says. In 1995, he very famously said, I don't need to have an internet division. Anybody remember that? <laughs> Most of you weren't alive in 1995. <laughs> I was two years old. Um, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> he said, I don't need an internet division because, I mean, it would be like having an electric division. It's a funny thing that happened. At that time, I was reading about the history of technology adoption. It's fascinating, actually, as an engineer to make that transition into history. And I was reading about the adoption of rail technology and about electricity. And you know, between 1900 and 1910, all over the world, big companies did have electricity divisions. And what did those divisions do? They tried to figure out how to use this new technology to optimize their distribution systems or optimize their retailing systems or optimize their manufacturing systems. How to use this technology intelligently. And those divisions are gone now. Well, they're not really. They're now called janitors. They now replace light bulbs. It's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about your own career path. 1999, Bill Gates changed direction completely and he, and he published this. He said to all of his people, the internet changes everything. Do you believe it? Who believes it? See, these are the people, by the way, who have not figured out that you should never answer my questions. I think it seems true, but I, and I'll give you some cases where it's true. 
Um, and I think some of them, you can, you, they're mostly obvious, especially the top one. So years and years ago, you know, like last week, um, we listened to music with um, these round plastic discs. Anybody remember those? Remember the big ones, the big black ones? Who remembers the big black ones? <laughs> you liars. <laughs> <laughs> right. <coughs> now we don't use physical media at all. We listen, we listen to music from computers, right? They don't look like that computer. That's a laptop computer. They typically look like this computer. This is a Blackberry. I'll be explaining later for anyone who needs to understand. I like Canadian products. It's, it's a thing. It has a replaceable battery. Does yours? <laughs> um, The way we make music has changed too, by the way. We use computers as well, the way we read news. I mean, in, in many American cities especially, there are no newspapers anymore. Instead, we read news online. I read my news online, um, but that's because I'm never at home, so a newspaper wouldn't do me much good. Um, we watch television on, on the internet as well. My children, who are in their mid-20s, they, yes, they were born before I was, correct. Um, my children never watch anything over the air. I just found out they didn't even realize you could watch television over the air, nor do they have cable service. Everything they watch comes from the internet, legally. <laughs> oh, we determined there were no lawyers in the room. So that's right. I'm here to tell you, though, that these markets have been irrevocably changed. Anything that can be delivered electronically, that has been changed. But there are some Im interesting and huge markets that have been untouched by the internet, and I'll tell you about a few of them. So here's one. Anybody recognize that box? So nobody's willing to put their hands up anymore. <laughs> I can see the spot under your, oh no, that's it. Um, that is a Modicon 584 programmable logic controller, um, a PLC for short. Anybody ever work in manufacturing? Or you're all too cool to be in manufacturing? <laughs> nobody's, you're not real engineers unless you've been in manufacturing. That box was used to run a manufacturing line. This particular one at a company in Detroit, I will say the name, it was called General Motors. It still is called General Motors. They used to make cars. You may have heard of them. What's that? I, I'm, th this, I'm the speaker. You sh pipe down. <laughs> this is 35 years ago. It's before you were born. Shut up. That box controlled a, what's called a discrete manufacturing line. In fact, that particular box was used to control a line that was making brake linings. Very exciting, I know, brake linings, yes. How many people have ever built brake linings? How many people have ever seen a brake lining? How many people in here who have lives that depend on brake linings? All of you, all of you, yes, just certainly you. He's just the only guy that knows it, right? So uh, it, it basically controls a line that says, you know, take a block of whatever, steel, titanium, asbestos, carve a piece off the corner, then move it to the next stop in the manufacturing line and put a hole in the middle of it and then move it to the next stop and sand off the edges and then move it to the next stop and so forth. Okay, that's what it does. It was a very, very different computer on the outside. In fact, that language next to it, that graph there, that's actually the programming language used for programmable logic controllers in 1980. It's called ladder, uh, ladder logic or, logic or ladder diagrams. Completely different than most programming languages at the time, and than all programming languages at the time, and still different from most programming languages today, unless you're using a graphical programming language. How many of you are using UML? Oh, you are. The, this is the better half of the, of the room, I just want to say. There are a lot more UML. How about SysML? BPMN? ABCD? I'm starting to make them up now. <laughs> okay. The interesting thing is inside this box was a computer like any other computer. In fact, it was based on a Motorola 68000. A lot of mini computers were based on the Motorola 68000 at the time. But on the outside, it was not connected to any other computer. Even though there were a lot of network computers already, there was no way to connect that computer to the computer that was keeping track of inventory on the factory floor, for example. So if you want to take information from this machine that was managing the manufacturing on the floor and take that information and put it into the what was then called manufacturing resource planning, it's now called enterprise resource planning, you had to actually print it out and then type it back in. By the way, the error rate was 40%, 40%. On, on average, ah, who cares? A little, you know, error here or there. You might, you know, carve a person instead of a block of titanium. That happens. Here's the amazing thing. We're 35 years later. The box looks different. It's no longer made by a company made called Modicon because the company's been bought and sold. 
right? It's now made by a company called Schneider Automation. It's a French company with a German name in the United States. <laughs> Don't even ask where a company is anymore. It doesn't really mean anything. It uses the same programming language. Isn't that bizarre? 35 years later, nothing has changed. Here's the worst part. The new box is different in a bunch of ways. It's plastic instead of metal, uh, but it has an Ethernet port on the outside. So obviously, you could connect your operational systems to your information systems. No, you can't. Because the operational systems speak things like Modbus. Ever heard of Modbus? Nobody in here has heard of Modbus, but uh, one, that guy has heard of Modbus, or he just wanted to put his hand up because he hadn't had a chance. He's not the guy I shut up before. Don't worry, it's okay. It doesn't connect to the information systems. And what's lacking there is what I call a lack of internet thinking. They weren't thinking in 1980, how do we connect this to the internet? Anybody know why? Because there was no internet. There were a bunch of different networks at the time, right? There was the ARPANET and the CSNET and the BITNET and the JNET, and I, I used many of them. Um, and the idea in 1978 was we could connect them together with an internet working protocol, IP. That's where the word internet comes from. But it was just starting in 1980. The thing is, it's not just starting anymore, and the web's been with us for over 20 years at this point. And still, there's a lack of internet thinking in that space. I can give you a bunch more examples. Here's one. Power networks of the world, um, power distribution, uh, generation distribution and transmission systems, in the most of them were designed around 1940, 1950. And they assumed a small number of power generators that were on all the time and a large number of power users, say hundreds of millions of people, right, in a, in a power network. I actually don't know much about the power network of, uh, uh, of um, uh, Bulgaria, but I will tell you Germany has two power networks. Guess why? Correct. That's the right guess. Um, but they are interconnected. That's unfortunately not enough to share, the, uh, to share electricity very well. Quite often you have enough electricity in the north of Germany and not enough in the south of Germany. So that's, uh, that's just life. They have to figure out a way to share it back and forth. It would be much easier to do if there was information flowing over that network, not just electricity, but there isn't. They weren't designed for, for information to flow over the network, only electricity, and only one way, from the generators to the users. Now, there have been a lot of changes since 1950 in the electricity world. For example, anybody drive a hybrid or electric car? <laughs> Thank you. These, <laughs> these three guys lied just for me. <laughs> and I didn't even give them chocolate. No, it's, um, that's a private joke for a few of you. Um, it's chocolate for me? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's the key to the car. Okay, excellent. I don't have a car key in my pocket. I came here in a hybrid car, however. It was green. I knew it was green because on the outside it was green. Um, <laughs> So we have these hybrid and electric cars, so there are batteries all over the place. There are industrial plants with huge uh, amount of battery storage, and yet nobody's taking advantage of that on the net. Also, nobody is really yet taking advantage of the fact that if you made these networks, these electrical networks, smaller, then you could do more intelligent sharing between the networks, the same way we've moved from radio telephones that would offer 12 or 16 circuits in a city the size of Sofia and now have thousands of or tens of thousands of conversations possible because you have small cellular mobile networks. So there are some things that you could do to make that system better. Um, also, we have new sources of electricity like solar and wind and thermal and tidal that are not constant. Right? All of the sources in 1950 were constant. They were coal and nuclear uh, and gas and so forth. Now we've got non-constant ones, so we need to be able to store the electricity. We need to be able to move it back and forth and so forth. And I'm here to tell you, 65 years later, the networks look exactly the same. Nothing has changed. There are experimental smart grids all over the world, but nothing that's actually rolled out to a real city until next year. Here's another one, one more, because I know you, were, you just loved the first two. Anybody in the jet engine space? Anybody work with jets? Anybody like jets? Anybody enjoy airplanes? Airplanes are cool, by the way, okay? For those of you who don't know, airplanes are really cool. Do you know why airplanes are cool? Why are airplanes cool? I'm not asking you. I'm going to tell you why airplanes are cool. Airplanes are cool because I know exactly how they work, which, by the way, has nothing to do with the Bernoulli principle. That person lied to you. Airplanes are really cool because even if you know exactly how they work, it's magic. 
600 metric tons, right? That's a 747. 800 metric tons for an Airbus 380. And you get it up to 140 knots, you have the flaps and slats extended, it takes off into the air. That's magic, obviously. The jets are even more magic, right? Jet engines are amazing inside. And starting in the 1960s, people started to put um, all kinds of metrics on those engines. They put the devices all over the engine to measure the efficiency, figure out how much bypass was going through the bypass. How many of you understood that? Thank you very much. We got a couple of jet engine people that didn't put their hands up before. But if they know what bypass is, they know what an engine is. So measuring the bypass, measuring uh, the efficiency of each stage of the compressor and so forth. And if you wanted to get that information from the jet engine, then somebody had to walk up to the jet engine while the jet's on the, f while the, jet's on the ground, plug a cable into it, download it into a computer, take a look at it and decide whether maybe something looks good or doesn't look good, like maybe the jet is going to stop working, um, and then s maybe send it off to the jet engine manufacturer um, you could see that a better way to do that would be to have the, the aircraft pull into the gate. Every, every airport in the world has Wi-Fi. Connect to the Wi-Fi of the airport, automatically upload all the, all the efficiency data from the engine onto the airport's Wi-Fi and then up to the jet engine manufacturer. They have lots of benchmark data that they can use to see how that jet is working. Um, and then they could, they could tell you, you know, maybe you ought to replace blade three on compressor stage two or something like that and get better efficiency out of the engine. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. It didn't happen in 1960 because there wasn't an internet. There is an internet today, but it doesn't really, hasn't really changed. Rather than a cable, you might use a USB key, but that's about the best that's going to happen. It's not real time. It's not automatic. And there are lots of other examples which I hope to get to there. I'm not going to read these all to you. Um, they're in the rail space, in, the, in automobiles, or for example, how, how do self-driving cars, or how will they talk to each other? Not just how do they drive themselves, but how do they talk to each other to avoid accidents? After all, our airplanes do that today with TCAS. The cars should ought to be able to do it as well. Smart homes and so forth. What's lacking in all of these spaces in internet thinking? The idea that we could use the internet to change, completely disrupt how those markets work. So we've seen these kinds of revolutions before. Anybody remember the Industrial Revolution? <laughs> now I would know you're lying, like that guy back there, right? He's, he's 150 years old. So starting about 1820, 1830, and in full force by 1850, 1860, there was this revolution, mostly in England, eventually spread to the entire world. Um, it was uh, started with things like steam power and locomotion from uh, locomotives, from, um, ra railroad and so forth. The interesting thing about that revolution is it created an enormous, enormous rise in productivity, between two and a half and four times, depending on which economist you don't believe. I don't believe any of them. But anyway, somewhere between two and a half and four times. There was a social disruption that came with it, obviously, right? Um, uh, so you, I'm sure some of you have read about the Luddites in England or the Webers in Germany who went around trying to destroy these automated looms because they were destroying jobs. I had a lovely conversation yesterday uh, uh, last night, uh, yesterday afternoon in Barcelona with a uh, taxi driver who was talking to me about self-driving cars, and he's very much looking forward to self-driving cars. <laughs> no, he's not. So there's a huge social disruption that comes with it, and that's something that governments need to help us prepare for. I think it's actually the most important thing they can do, not regulatory action. Uh, but, in fact, many more jobs were created than lost. Uh, obviously, jobs were created, but p somebody had to build and maintain those automated looms. But also, this enormous leap in productivity created new jobs as well because of the huge new demand that came from the huge productivity. Far more jobs at the end of the Industrial Revolution than at the beginning. We saw this again, by the way, at the end of the 20th century. Some of you might remember the Internet Revolution. The Internet Revolution, rather than replacing human brawn with machine brawn, it replaced human connectivity with machine connectivity. And again, we saw a huge leap in productivity, um, especially people in Silicon Valley, but we won't talk about them. Um, again, it was about two and a half to four times increase in productivity. Again, jobs were lost. So, for example, um, uh, books, book sales are headed right down the tubes at high speed. Um, booksellers have pretty much disappeared in the United States except for small independent ones. And although I love books personally, I'm old enough to enjoy leafing through a book, I read on a Kindle like many of you do. Actually, it's not a Kindle, but it's a Kindle application on a tablet. So jobs were lost, again, but jobs were created. For example, there were not a whole lot of webmasters in 1990. There was just one. His name was Tim. That's true, actually, by the way. 
His name is now Sir Tim, and there are now millions of webmasters worldwide. So we think this is going to happen again. If you can take that internet thinking and add it to industrial systems, we think that you're, there's going to be another huge leap in productivity. How big is the opportunity? That's a great question. Well, most people talk about these opportunities on the left there. Um, that is sort of retail opportunities. How many of you are wearing Fitbits? How many of you have ever looked at it? So that's it, very interesting. So one person said she was wearing a Fitbit, and 10 other people said they've looked at it. So they've been looking at your Fitbit, I just want to say. <laughs> um, that's very strange. By the way, that's the number one. 90% uh, of Fitbits are never looked at after they come out of the box. 90%. It uh, has a huge return rate as well. So we're not talking about those, uh, those retail systems. We're talking about industrial systems, like the things I've been talking about, electrical power distribution, maintenance, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, manufacturing, uh, smart driving cars, but only in the system, systemic sense, that is, that talk to the infrastructure, that talk to each other, and so forth. How big is the opportunity? Thank you for asking. Um, well, I never believe analysts, so uh, you have to put in several different analyst estimates. I think one of the best here was done by General Electric. So this is done by the chief economist of General Electric. It's the first one on this list here. His name is Marco Annunziata. Uh, yeah, as you can tell from the name, he's American. Um, what? It's a mongrel nation. Get used to it. Um, he's, he looked at the world economy in 2012, which was about 70 trillion US dollars. That's about uh, 120 billion lev. And said, of that, 46% has been untouched by the, industrial revo uh, by the uh, internet revolution. 46% of a huge market. That comes out to $32.3 trillion. 60 trillion, 60 trillion lev, nothing much. That's a huge opportunity, isn't it? By the way, the other numbers look pretty similar. Cisco. Uh, increased private sector profits by 20 percent. Uh, Gartner, uh, 300 billion dollars uh, in new opportunity. McKinsey, 36 trillion dollars in operating costs saved. Whether you call it Internet of Things, a little bit uh, to the northwest of here, they call it, they call it Internet for, f I'm sorry, they call it Industrie 4.0. Any Germans in the room? So then in that case, I pronounced it really well. Um, uh, the Chinese call it Internet Plus, the Japanese call it in, uh, Industry Value Chain Initiative. Um, several governments, including the government of the United States, calls it Cyber Physical Systems. I like that phrase because it means nothing. <laughs> it sounds so cool, but it means nothing. Um, whether you, wh what, it, what I call it is uh, adding Internet thinking to industrial systems. L let me just look at, at one, uh, some examples. I keep turning this off. Let me just uh, look at some examples of where, that, uh, where those opportunities come from. This is the single, most, the single most valuable opportunity, is new revenue generation. There are really new revenue opportunities in this world. For example, let's say I want a jet engine from Gen General Electric or Rolls-Royce or Avic or CFM or, uh, or any of the other uh, jet engine manufacturers. I can go and buy it from any of them the same way I bought it from them for many, many years, which is I buy it for about 80% of the, of the value of the engine. That's they, they actually give me a huge discount when they sell me an engine. Why do they do that? Because they're going to sell me spare parts for the next 40 to 50 years, and they're going to make some profit on those spare parts. If I go to Rolls-Royce or General Electric today, however, they will offer to, to sell me an engine on a lease basis. That is, they'll sell me that engine for a certain amount of tens of thousands of pounds of propulsion, sorry, it really is sold in pounds, for a certain number of hours, and they'll guarantee a certain amount of fuel use. And if I use more fuel than that for those number of hours for that amount of propulsion, they will actually pay for the fuel. In fact, General Electric will, get, will lower the fuel guarantee by 1% a year. I call it propulsion as a service. <laughs> I got to know the rest of that laugh at some point. What, why was that so funny? But it is, it is. It's propulsion sold as a service. It's a whole new rever revenue opportunity. I have to change the way that I account for sales. I have to change a lot of the way that I operate in my organization. And now, if I'm Rolls-Royce, for example, I have to maintain that engine. It's not going to be maintained by the guy that doesn't own it, the airline. It's going to be maintained by me. On the other hand, I know more about that engine than anybody else in the world because I made all of those engines. I have benchmark data on all those engines. And if I can get that data quickly, I can actually keep it at peak efficiency. So there's revenue opportunities. Actually, this points to the last one on the list, which is, I think, the other important one. And that is, we're looking at a world probably 30, 40 years in the future where products don't fail. 
even trivial products, even toys. Or if they are going to fail, we get a spare part in the mail, not the U.S. mail, but something that actually works. Um, that nobody was recording that, hopefully, because um, I'm expecting to get some mail at home tomorrow. Um, uh, I, I expect to get a replacement part or a replacement product before it actually fails because they have benchmark data on the product. They know when it's going to fail. They know what parts are in trouble and so forth. Here's General Electric's, the rest of General Electric's report. I mean, it's worth looking at the whole report, but this is really interesting. Annunciata looked at the, the, uh, the top markets that General Electric is in, and they said, what are the potential savings? What are the potential savings in those markets? So General Electric's in a, in a bunch of different markets, basically healthcare and things that turn. That was told to me by the CEO of General Electric, so it must be true. And, um, and these are the 15-year savings. Uh, in dollars, sorry, but you know, multiply by 1.8 and it's lev, um, uh, if for their biggest markets. So an example, from 2012 to 2027, an expected savings of 30 billion US dollars, two trillion dollars a year. Two billion, I said trillion, sorry, two billion dollars a year. Any Brits in the audience? That would be 2,000 million. Oh, thank God, I don't have to do that. Um, in uh, in gas-powered engines, 66 billion dollars over 15 years. Um, I'm not going to read them all to you. I like this one in the bottom middle. Um, it's, uh, I if, you put, um, uh, if you put television cameras on the shoulders of policemen, um, it has been shown that uh, crime goes down by two-thirds in that region. There are two possible reasons. I'm not getting into it. Um, the, um, <coughs> the, the, the other one that actually interests me the most, and I'm going to give you an example right at the end, is the one in the upper right. And that's over $4 billion a year in savings in medical liability because we can connect the systems better. Again, I'll give you a very specific example at the end. So these are great, huge markets to go after. How do we attack them? How do we get there? I mean, obviously, we need the standards makers and the big data companies and the st statistical companies and the manufacturers and the banks and the, and the mining companies and so forth to get together to figure out how to do this on a one-to-one -one basis. It's going to take forever and it's probably never going to happen. So what we've done is we've created an organization called the Industrial Internet Consortium, or IIC, or just IC for short. I didn't name it. I just have to put up with it bringing together the standards makers and the, re the research community and the academics and the big data companies and the technology uh, systems integrators and so forth to solve problems using internet thinking in industrial systems. That's the idea of the Industrial Internet Consortium. So they put together a mission statement because that's what companies do first. They put together mission statements. Don't read it. Last three words in red are the only important words. Transformational business outcomes. What this comes down to is this technology is going to disrupt their markets. It's going to disrupt their markets. That's a great word, disrupt. And they've decided to do the disruption themselves rather than wait for somebody to disrupt them. S disrupt them. Understand? It's going to happen. Might as well do it to yourself. Um, in, my in my other life, I advise startup companies. I've been involved in about uh, 35 startup companies over the years. And uh, the first thing I teach people is, it's always better to cannibalize your own product than to wait for somebody else to do it for you. Because then you, they can spit out the bones. That's not that funny. Anyway, so the CEOs of these five companies, uh, General Electric, IBM, Intel, Cisco, and AT&T, got together on March 27th, 2014, and said, we're going to actually build test beds and see whether this stuff really works. We don't think that all the test beds are going to succeed. In fact, you learn more from failure than success. It's been said many times, and it's actually true. Failure is the price you pay for success. But if you don't do test beds, you can't actually figure out what needs to be done, what should be standardized, what is going to work, what gives you new opportunities for products and new services. Build test beds, see what works, and that's what we're doing. So who's doing it? Thanks for asking. Um, uh, 18 months ago, we thought that there would be about 80 to 100 members today. There are 225 this morning. Uh, these are the big ones. About 40% of our member companies are big companies. So joining our five founders are uh, Schneider Electric, uh, that I mentioned before, Schneider, Elec uh, Schneider Automation, and SAP. Um, but also uh, another about uh, 90 big companies. I think it's worth pointing out that they're not all technology companies. I'm sure you've seen a couple, you see a couple up there that are not, not really technology companies. Toyota, you might know, is a company that makes things like cars. Right? And they actually think, What's he looking at? He's pointing and looking. Who did uh, I leave out? 
It's not all the members, they don't fit. And they're not in alphabetical order, so you'll never find it anyway. And they're not in Cyrillic alphabetical order, more importantly. Um, so Toyota's up there. Um, I like the one in the upper left-hand corner, that's Codelco. Anybody ever heard of Codelco? Anybody ever heard of copper? Yeah, okay, right. You've got copper-colored hair, though. That's cheating. 35% of all copper in the world comes from one mine in northern Chile, in South America. It's mined by one company called Codelco. And they think that they need to change the way that they operate those mines. For example, they would like to network the mines so they'd know where there's high carbon dioxide, high, high carbon monoxide, low levels of oxygen, changing pressure, which is not good in a mine, underground mine. It means the mine is about to, you know, collapse. But there's a problem. It's a copper mine. You can't build a wireless network in a copper mine. Mr. Faraday says it's illegal. <laughs> All the electrical engineers, by the way, laughed at that joke, and they're going to have a little remedial thing over here for anybody who didn't get it later on. <laughs> but they're not all big companies, because you know what? A lot of innovation comes from small companies. Um, and so there are a lot of small companies. 55% of our membership are small companies. And you're probably not going to recognize most of these company names. Uh, some of them are one or two people, and some of them are five or ten people, some of them are maybe 500 people. They are RFID manufacturers, they are big data analysis companies. Um, they are all, all over the place, actually, companies that do all sorts of things, but they bring innovation to the table. They have the same rights to participate and drive test beds as our other members. And there's a class of members that are what we call not-for-profit research organizations. They include universities like Te Technische Universität Darmstadt. Um, they include um, national agencies like NIST, which is the Science and Technology Agency, Science and Standards, Standards and Technology Agency of the United States. Um, also other governments as well. Um, and in fact, um, testing organizations. Uh, over on the right, for example, you see UL, uh, very much like the German organization TUV. Uh, this is a company that tests products to see um, if they are safe. And they realize that all products will have software now, so they're going to have to change the way they test things. So those 225 members are basically carrying out the following process. Come together as an ecosystem, find opportunities that they can use internet thinking in industrial systems. We call those use cases. Build security use cases for how those systems can be broken. And our security group is responsible not only for finding ways to break our systems, but in fact to try to break into the test beds, because we want to know where the problems are before they go live. Um, build an architecture, which we call in brilliantly the Industrial Internet Reference Architecture, or IIRA. We're really bad at names. I told you that, didn't I? IIRA. IRA. Um, and, uh, and then actually build test beds. So let's get to the test beds, and that's the interesting thing. This is the first test bed. The first test bed we, we announced in March of this year at Bosch Connected World in Berlin. Uh, it was led by, it still is led by Bosch, Tech Mahindra, and Cisco. So a German company, an Indian company, and an American company. And their idea was very simple, and that is if you could track every person, every part, every work in progress, and every tool on a factory floor, you could make the factory more efficient. You could make sure you were using every square meter of that, of that factory efficiently, and you could make the factory safer. And they actually do have demonstrations on the web where a guy jumps onto stage and he picks up a tool and it says, nope, you haven't been trained on that tool. Take training now or put the tool down. And the tool literally won't operate because he hasn't been trained on it. Or he picks up a part and he says, no, nope, that's the wrong part. Put it back and take one from bin two. Actually, this worked. Um, it worked on uh, Bosch's manufacturing floors and it worked on manufacturing floors of, I'm only allowed to say, a large European airframer. And, and, then they, and then foolishly, just uh, there are actually other European airframers than the one that you're thinking of, but there's only one that makes a four-engine jet aircraft. I'm just saying. Um, they don't make it anymore. Does that make it obvious to you now? Okay. Um, uh, that actually is coming to the end of phase one. Uh, they're starting phase two now. They're actually rolling it out to all of their manufacturing sites worldwide. The difference between phase one and phase two is, is sort of exemplifies what the consortium does. In phase one, they used simple Wi-Fi positioning. They just did Wi-Fi uh, triangulation with Cisco routers to give them one meter of resolution so they know where everything is on the factory floor within a meter. They want to be able to say that part is being put into the right hole on the right work in progress. To do that, they need three millimeters of resolution. So the obvious way to do that is just increase the frequency of the, of the routers, right? Unfortunately, for three millimeters resolution, you have to increase it to the X-ray frequency, and then it's not so good for the people on the factory floor. It turns out to be a downside. Uh, you have to wear lead clothing and, and so forth. 
Uh, so uh, actually, we're looking for other technology. We found some, some promising technology that might solve that problem. Three millimeters positioning is really hard, indoor positioning. Uh, just to give you an example of what positioning happens outside, GPS, um, sat-nav systems, typically give you 10 meters of resolution. Three millimeters is a lot smaller. Our second test bed um, is uh, now running in, uh, in Southern California in the United States. It's called the Command and Control Test Bed, and it's about how to build better smart grids, electric grids, for distribution and transmission of electricity. And if you build smaller grids and you integrate power sources that are non-constant, figure out a way for information to flow over that grid and be able to trade that information back and forth between neighboring grids or even not neighboring grids, and for example, when you have too much power on the grid, you don't turn off generators because that can be very expensive, but you sell it cheaply to people or sell it cheaply to storage devices on the network. When you don't have enough power on the network, you try to buy it from neighboring grids, but if you can't do that, you might actually buy it from the batteries that are on the network, with, for like hybrid and electric cars. This one's led by, national, uh, by RTI with the support of National Instruments and Cisco. Another great example from this one is most of you have never heard of RTI. Uh, successful but small company in, in uh, Northern California that makes uh, real-time um, integration software. Uh, and they lead this test bed, just like Bosch leads the last one. The next one I just, just visited, actually, last week in Cork. Anybody ever been to Cork? The weather there is magnificent. Uh, one day it got all the way up to 10 degrees. Um, and I think there was about 15 minutes where it didn't rain. They explained to me I was only there three days, though. They explained to me that the weather in Ireland is always the same. It's either raining or about to rain. Um, and, and unfortunately, when I was there, it was pretty much always the former. Um, but we, I went and visited the infinite testbed activity. What they're doing is integrating all of the information systems in the County Cork, the uh, province in southern Ireland. And they're going to be running a bunch of different tests on top of that testbed. The first one they're doing is fascinating, and I like it because it's about saving lives. When you call an ambulance to your home, the ambulance arrives at your home knowing nothing about you, nothing at all. And their entire job is just keep you alive until you get to the hospital. In Cork, starting in the next couple of weeks, they have integrated the National Health, Infor National Health Services information about you, um, which the county maintains, the province maintains. And they're actually uploading it live into the ambulance as the ambulance is on the way to your home. So if you have high blood pressure or you have Alzheimer's disease or you have diabetes and so forth, they can differentially treat you better and save lives. And of course, they can also do it the other way around, upload that information back to the hospital while they're en route so the hospital knows what they're dealing with, your current blood pressure and so forth. This is just fantastic, and it's amazing to me nobody's done it anywhere else. Um, so that's, that test bed is running now, and uh, we'll go live this, uh, I think it's next, next month, actually. There will be running other test beds, everything from... Uh, from road repairs to the not a lot of snow removal. It doesn't get that cold, um, but, uh, you know, drunk removal and things like that. It's Ireland. Come on. Nobody thought that was funny? How about, how about my best Finnish joke? Are you ready for a Finnish joke? Any Finns in the room? Excellent. Um, so, you ready? Two Finns walk past a bar. Finns, by the way, think that is absolutely hilarious. So um, the next test bed that we announced is called condition monitoring. The idea is if you could track everything that's happening in a factory in a, um, or, you know, or, in a, uh, or in a hospital or anywhere, basically, can they generalize the idea of predictive maintenance for any large systems? Um, this one's being led by IBM and National Instruments, and um, it will go live next year. Uh, another one which is being built by General Electric is a high-speed network, and when I say high-speed, I mean terabits per second, integrating all of GE's research centers worldwide, on which they're going to be running a bunch of different test beds, some in the area of public health, which always interests me as well. Next one, an asset efficiency test bed led by Infosys with the support of Intel, Bosch, and PTC. Um, and that is just how do we maximize the efficiency of, of a bunch of assets in any system? whether it is insurance assets or whether it's manufacturing assets or whether it's uh, ore in a copper mine. It could be anything. Um, so we have a bunch of different interesting test beds happening, and the output of those test beds, as I say, will be new products and services, but also will be requirements for standards. As we build these test beds, we discover, gee, this would have been much easier if we had a standard for something. I'll give you a very specific example. As I said, our first test bed is coming to the end of phase one. And what it does is it integrates all of the, all of the devices, all of the um, tools on a manufacturing floor. 
There are no, there is no standard anywhere in the world for drivers for tools on a factory floor. So that requirement for a standard has been given over to the object management group, which I also conveniently happen to run. Uh, and OMG is, will start developing standards for, uh, for tools, on factory tools, devices, uh, starting next month. We have liaison with about 15 other standards organizations besides OMG. GS1 is, you may not know, but it, they're the people that standardize the uh, UPC barcodes that are on every product you've ever seen. Uh, Eclipse Foundation is the open source organization. Anybody use Eclipse tools? Excellent. I actually participated in the creation of Eclipse Foundation, very proud of it. Uh, it's a separate organization, not part of our organization, but they did a great job. The Smart Grid Interoperability Platform, SGIP, DIN. Anybody know what DIN is? Nobody knows what DIN is. One person. It's, it used to be the German Standards Organization, Deutsche Institut for, for Normung. Um, but uh, they insist that they are international. So I asked them, what does the D stand for? Assuming the answer would be D for Deutsche, German, in German. And he said, no, no, it stands for Dienst, which means service. So I said, okay, fine. If you look on their website, it says Deutsche, they're German. Um, but we work with many, many, many different standards organizations. And of course, of course including the, uh, uh, the I ISO. How many of you have heard of ISO? How many of you know what it stands for? You're all lying. It stands for inter it stands for International Organization for Standards, ISO, or it stands for Organisation Internationale de Tandar. In neither language is it ISO. That's what they're about: fairness, whatever that means. Look, none of this technology is new. I don't want to leave you with the concept, the idea that IoT is new. IoT is a simple pattern: take information from thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of sensors. They might be planet-wide or more. Do predictive real-time analytics on that information, typically in the cloud, but could be anywhere. And then deliver decision support uh, and analysis to decision makers or have, uh, have impact directly on actuators with human out of the loop. That's IoT. What we're looking at is to apply that pattern to industrial systems. Very simple idea. The technology is not particularly new. Don't let anyone tell you it is. But what we are seeing is a convergence of a number of factors. Processing power has gone to zero. It's free. I mean, essentially free. I mean, the, the computer in my pocket is as powerful or more than all of the computers put together when I arrived at MIT. There was a list of them, by the way. There were 200. That was 1978, by the way, and none of you were born. So, hey. um, so the low-cost processing power, low-cost storage, ubiquitous con connectivity. I mean, even in here, we've got Wi-Fi. It doesn't work very well, but we've got it. Actually, it just makes the demos fail. I think it's really carefully planned. Very well done, Georgi. Um, um, now, a lot of presentations start with there are going to be 70 billion devices or 100 billion or 50 trillion or a billion, billion, billion devices on the net. Who cares? That's not interesting. The fact is that we can connect things, and we should be able to do interesting things with that. You can start with big data for free today. That's an enormous change. And if you want uh, processing power, you can rent it from, uh, from the likes of A IBM or Microsoft or Amazon or Salesforce or Google or somebody else on the fly only for the time that you need it. That allows us to build smarter machines that generate smarter products, that generate smart data. So as you can tell, I hate builds. Um, that's going to lead us to a smarter future, and we actually think things are coming together today to make that happen. I told you I'd give you one real example from the healthcare space, and here's the example. It's on the right-hand side of that slide. Anybody recognize that blue device? I'm sorry to hear it. Um, for those of you who don't recognize it, it's called a pulse oximeter. It sits on your finger, and it tries to guess how much oxygen is in your blood. Why does it do that? Because if the amount of oxygen in your blood drops below 90% of norms for more than four minutes, you don't have to worry about anything ever again. <laughs> but you notice I said, guess. It turns out we have different colors of skin. We have different thicknesses of arterial walls. And it's really only guessing. Uh, anybody care to guess how often it's right? I'll tell you, 80%. 20% of the readings are wrong. Nurses know that. So if they get an alarm, and they have 50 patients in an intensive care unit, one alarm, pfft, we'll ignore it. Two alarms, well, it's bad, but who knows. Three alarms, maybe we better send somebody in there. You can't blame them. They're overworked as it is. And after all, you do have four minutes. <laughs> well, you do. Four minutes oxygen, four days water, four weeks food. That's the deal. Um, there's actually another big problem with, uh, with these things, and that is um, typically 
uh, you're supposed to put the uh, pulse oximeter on one arm and the uh, blood pressure cuff on the other arm. The automated blood pressure cuff that was checking you when you were in the hospital to make sure your blood pressure was still good. But in a hurry, nurses quite often will put the blood pressure cuff and the pulse oximeter on the same arm. And when the blood pressure cuff blows up, come on, you said you were engineers. <laughs> Oxygen goes to zero. So obviously all you got to do is look at the chart, and nurses know this. They look at that and say, oh, look at that pattern. Okay, I just put the BP monitor on the wrong arm. And they might go in and fix it, or they might just say, I'll remember. Wouldn't it be better if the, blood, the pulse oximeter talked to the blood pressure monitor and said, gee, uh, the, uh, I'm, you're blowing up right now. I think I'll stop reading for a minute. Nobody in the world does that. In fact, you could also integrate it with respiration sensors. Respiration sensor is basically just a weight on your chest. It goes up and down as your chest goes up and down. If you are not breathing as much as you were a few minutes ago and your uh, blood oxygen is falling, guess what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad, right? It's crash cart time. So why not integrate them? The answer is they all speak on different networks with different protocols. If they all spoke TCP IP, if they all use the internet, it would be much easier to integrate them, and that's one of the things we're doing. And that's not just about saving medical liability, that's saving lives. So I actually think that's kind of interesting. So uh, yeah, that's the marketing slide, you can ignore it. Um, this is what happens when you let marketing people touch your slides. Don't do it. I was an engineer once. So if you have infor any questions now, I will take questions until Georgi says shut up and sit down, um, uh, which he hasn't done yet, so it's okay. Uh, if you think of a question later, this is how to reach me. Um, the uh, telephone probably works best. Uh, you're if, you, if I don't answer your email within two days, uh, I, I'm not ignoring you. It went to spam, so call. Um, I apologize for the picture. It was taken 35 kilos ago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so you were clapping, so the pulse oximeters were show you're awake. Any questions? Any answers? Yes, sir. <laughs> Speak loudly. Project. I can't hear you. <laughs> Here it comes. Sorry. I'm not really sorry. I just thought it'd be funny. Proba. Up. So my question is about security. Yes. Uh, I know it's one kind of hacking if my refrigerator is hacked and my food is gone, but the other option is that my health uh, systems are somehow broken, yeah, and so I'm going to die. Easy so come. who is taking care for that? E easy come, easy go. Always one for the cheap laugh. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned refrigerators, actually, because the first Linux uh, refrigerators have already shipped a few years ago. Uh, they were shipped by General Electric. They actually had Linux on them, and they sent messages that would like text you if you ran out of milk. This is like, I don't know how I lived without that before. Um, I don't drink milk, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and they were hacked within about two weeks of shipping. And there were actually uh, distributed uh, denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks from GE refrigerators all over the world. <laughs> <It's like laughs> they fixed it. They fixed it. Seriously. First, it's really important to understand something about our industry. No matter how bad we do, we're going to ship it. And there's going to, there are going to be some problems, right? <laughs> our approach to solving that is to attack our systems, to, to white hat our own systems. So we have a security use case group that's led by two really good security people, um, but has about 30 people participating today, and you could join them, um, that are trying to figure out all of what we call security use cases, the attack vectors, basically. How do you find ways into these systems? And then, when our test beds are up and running, attacking them to see whether we can find a way in, um, because we're worried about exactly that. Um, I, I have to say, we are the only such public organization that I know that's doing that. I wish I ev everybody were doing it. And the reality is we're not going to find all the holes, and uh, bad things are going to happen. On the, other thing, on the other hand, I think fewer bad things are going to happen than happened today, for example, with the pulse oximeter and blood pressure monitors I mentioned. But yes, uh, we are taking it extremely seriously. Thank you. Thank you. We've all worked for organizations. By the way, I, I started my career as a software engineer, um, a, and uh, I was trained as an engineer at a reasonably good engineering school. And we have all been in the situation of building a prototype, showing the boss, and having the boss say, hey, that's great, ship it. Um, 
since that's not funny, is it? Because it's happened to all of you. Um, it's going to continue, unfortunately. So our, our job is to actually try to hack the prototypes. So we are. No more questions? Anybody have answers? <laughs> we could play Jeopardy. The answer is Toronto. Thank you very much. Thank you.